Hey everyone, Chris here with another filler video. One that I wasn't really expecting to make anytime soon, except, well, Apogee Software sent me a free copy of Crystal Caves HD, no strings attached. This HD remake was developed by Emberheart Games and came out about a month ago as of my making this video. So I figured, given the effort that I spent in my review of the original Crystal Caves, giving my thoughts on what kinds of changes can make an HD remake way better, it'd be pertinent for me to take a look at the HD game and see what issues were addressed what features were added which I wasn't expecting or asking for, and if any new issues have come about as a result of HDifying it. And again, I want to stress that even though I was sent a copy of the HD remake for free by Apogee Software, I was under no obligation to review it or anything like that. Thus, all of my opinions here are entirely my own. So let's get one thing out of the way right now because this is something you're already seeing and something you're already hearing. This game mixes retro styles together. The original Crystal Caves was an EGA game running at a low frame rate with no music and PC speaker sound effects. Whereas here, you have graphics more akin to what you would get with VGA, but they're moving silky smooth like on an old gaming console, along with brand new music done in the style of NES hardware, but still with the original PC speaker sounds. Essentially, this feels like a mix of both DOS VGA and NES styles together, and while I'm okay with this, I wouldn't be surprised if this might catch some people off guard. Now, heck, I know from personal experience with my old Pixel Ships retro game, which you all saw some gameplay of in the prior filler video, that mixing retro styles together sometimes doesn't trigger the kind of nostalgic response players want. In my case, I was trying to mix Atari 2600 and NES together, but I got a number of comments years ago when the game was brand new that it didn't feel retro because it didn't conform strictly to any one specific retro stage. Standard. But anyways, before we go over the changes I talked about in my review of the original game, I want to quickly go over some of the new features. For starters, there's a brand new fourth episode entitled The Final Frontier, and I can pretty much sum up the opening story to it as a mix of Star Trek The Motion Picture with the first episode of Star Trek Voyager. And as expected from an extra fourth episode, the levels are considerably more difficult than in the first three episodes. There's also brand new achievement and statistics systems in play, along with online leader boards, so the game's sort of been modernized on those fronts as well. Though perhaps the most notable addition is a fully featured level editor, along with Steam Workshop integration for sharing levels. Now I'll talk a little more about the editor later, as I have a couple things I want to say about it, but yeah, if you ever wanted to make your own levels for this game, you now have all the tools you need to do so. But anyways, let's go over the key points I brought up at the end of my review of the original game. Now I specifically asked for five changes. One, add a restart level button or menu option. 2. Make time-limited power-ups respawn when they expire, while at the same time tightening their time limits on a per-level basis to justify this. 3. Add a visual cue to go along with the audio cue when you collect the final crystal at a level. 4. Get rid of head bonking, allow the player to just slide across the ceiling as their jump continues to attempt to raise them up. And 5. Make it possible to get out of the upper left section of the episode 3 main level without having to use cheats or exploits. So let's go in order here. Number 1. Adding a restart level button or menu option. Well, sure enough, when you go into the menus mid-level, you do indeed now have a restart button. So yes, this has definitely been checked off the list, but with a caveat, because even though restarting levels is no longer a big deal, going back to the main hub level is. So in the original game, when selecting the option to quit while in the middle of a level, you had three options for how you wanted to quit. Either going back to the main level, going to the title screen, or quitting out entirely back to DOS. You had to select these by typing in an appropriate letter, so hitting any of these by accident was virtually impossible. However, here in the HD remake, this menu for selecting how you want to quit is now done with a selector using arrow keys to change your selection, and a confirmation button to confirm your selection. Uh, that's all well and good, except quitting out to the title screen is the default selection, meaning it's very possible now to accidentally quit out to the title screen when you mean to go back to the main level. Number two, making time-limited power-ups respawn. Well, there's an easy way to check this. We just grab a power-up and wait. Though I'll spare all of you the waiting. Three, two, one, and nope. 
power-up didn't come back. Although, I'm on normal skill right now, and I've been told that the power-ups do come back on easy skill, so let's actually go test that. So here we are again on easy skill. Grab the power-up, cut ahead. Three, two, one, and no. Still nothing. Okay, well it turns out the power-ups don't respawn, so I guess we're gonna have to... Oh, wait a minute. Uh, okay, they do respawn on easy skill, but why did that take so long? Okay, so I looked a bit deeper into this, and it turns out what's actually going on is that the power-ups on easy skill are designed to respawn a full 30 seconds after they expire. I mean, that kind of does the trick, but if you don't know what's going to happen, then you might just end up restarting the level anyways out of frustration. And no, the difficulty select screen does not tell you about this. In fact, something I didn't notice until much later is that there's no documentation about the gameplay anywhere in this game. I mean, it doesn't really need documentation because it's pretty straightforward as to what to do, but having no documentation at all leaves no avenue to learn about certain aspects of the game when someone who's never played the original game gives this one a shot. Anyways, all that said, I do think it's okay to have the power-ups only respawn on easy skill, because then you're basically identifying easy skill as a means of learning the game, with normal and hard being more about applying the skills that you've learned, requiring you to do it right or do it over. But having a 30 second cooldown on respawning power-ups on easy is kind of unnecessary, and it'd be better if it, they would just come back instantly once they expire. Number 3. Adding a visual cue once all crystals are collected. So, something I completely missed in my original coverage of Crystal Caves is that there is a visual indication once you've got all the crystals, but it's done by changing the color of the overscan area of a CRT monitor. The Dawson PC emulators by default typically don't emulate the overscan area because there's extraordinarily few programs which use that overscan area to convey information, since the most you can do with it is just change its one solid color and that's it. So needless to say, this is a very easy thing to miss unless you have experience running such a program on real hardware with a real CRT monitor. But, Crystal Caves HD went a step beyond in this aspect. Not only is there a thin green border which shows up around the gameplay when you get that final crystal in a level, but there's a red light on the exit door which turns green as well. Back in the original game, this light on the exit door is always red, no matter what. So even if that thin green border didn't show up in the HD remake, you'd still technically have one other visual cue when the exit door is on screen. Actually, there's a number of little touches which have been added to the game, which helps to add some extra depth to the experience. For instance, this grass here now shuffles when Milo walks past it. I mean, this is a really simple and pointless effect, but it helps to add to the immersion by making the world around you feel more alive. That said, there are some other such changes which I'm not sure I completely agree with. For instance, the few levels which start out dark start out very dark now. I mean, just compare these two side by side and you can see for yourself, it's a lot harder to see what you're doing. Now applying a gamma adjusting shader with a bit of a curve to the gamma values would probably give better results than just darkening the screen as is presently done. But fortunately, dark levels are few and far between, so this isn't really a major issue, but one I noticed all the same. Number 4, getting rid of head bonking. So this was one of the big ones that I had a lot of issues with, so I was really curious to see just how well this has been addressed. And, well, something weird's going on. As you can see, head bonking is still a thing, yet I'm able to make these kinds of jumps really easily, whereas in the original game this was extraordinarily difficult. Like, surely it's not just because of the smooth motion, right? Well again, the answer is somewhere in the middle. So, in the original game, the low frame rate made it very difficult to jump out of two tile tall gaps without hitting your head. Here, because everything is so smooth, you can actually get closer to the edge before making your jump, and jump out of such a gap with less precision on your timing. So, head bonking doesn't even come into play anymore with properly timed jumps out of these kinds of gaps. But, more pertinently, in the original game, bonking your head on the ceiling cancelled both your vertical and horizontal momentum. But here in the HD remake, only your vertical momentum is cancelled out. You keep your horizontal momentum. It may not seem like that big a deal at first, but given the precision required to clear some of these jumps over nasty things in the original, here in the remake, they're much more doable. You still need to be precise, but not as precise. In fact, this one simple change has also made it possible to jump over the toxic corpses of poisonous enemies in two tile-tall hallways. And this one's pretty precise, but again, the high frame rate makes this pretty reliable once you have the timing down. 
So yeah, head bonking is still technically present, but no longer an issue anymore due to changes in the mechanics of how it and movement in general works. And lastly, number five, making it possible to get out of the upper left corner of the episode three main hub level. Well, there's a barrel here now that you can stand on. Yep, not stuck in that corner anymore if you go there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course this was gonna get fixed. So, for the most part, I found this HD remake to be much more playable than the original game. The higher frame rate, coupled with the subtle changes to the mechanics, do indeed make the game much more playable. But there are still some odd issues which need to be addressed. So keep in mind if you're watching this video in the future, there's a pretty good chance some or all of the following issues will be fixed. But one of the more blatantly obvious issues is that there's no visual indication as to when sound or music is muted. In the options menu, if you hit the enter key while you have the sound or music volume slider selected, you'll toggle their mute state. But there's no visual indication as to if they're muted in this manner or not, which can end up confusing you if you accidentally do this and don't know that they even can be muted in this way. In fact, staying on the topic of audio, there's some definite inconsistencies with the volume of some of the sound effects. Now, in some cases it makes sense, because there's fall off with distance on all the sound effects now. Thus, the further away something is from the player when the sound effect is generated, the quieter it is. But here's an instance where it's kind of excessive. Well, first let me play a moment of gameplay with just a normal baseline level of volume before I demonstrate this. Okay, now listen to how loud this gets. Again, this is with the same baseline volume settings. Basically, any sound effects which end up repeated multiple times simultaneously end up sounding way too loud. Plus, there's also some serious volume when you hit a multi-hit enemy with one of your shots. And also, the music test in the level editor is way too loud as well. Another weird thing has to do with dying. Now, death animations play out as normal most of the time, but I've noticed almost every time I die due to touching an enemy, the game almost immediately cancels out of the death animation and restarts the level. So I think there might simply be a lack of a debounce on that, as it might be detecting keys which are already being held down as having just been pushed to cancel the death animation instead. I also have a couple of minor gripes with the level editor. Now, for the most part, it works pretty well, but there are a couple odd things about how it works. And the more minor issue is that you can't overwrite anything. And once you place a tile or an object, you can use the hand cursor to move objects around, but you can't overwrite tiles or objects with new tiles or objects. You have to erase them first, and then you can put new stuff in its place. It is kind of a weird way of going about it, but it's nothing egregious. Not like the shift key bug. So yeah, it turns out some aspects of the editor are keyed to detect both shift keys, but some aspects, while showing that they work with both shift keys, only work with the left shift key. Now since the shift keys are used to erase tiles and objects, I found it extremely confusing at first that I'd be holding down right shift and could erase tiles just fine, but then would be incapable of erasing power-ups despite seeing the erase cursor show up. Yet if I held the left shift key down, everything worked as expected. Actually, I'm going to be uploading this level I made to the Steam Workshop in case anyone wants to give it a go, so look for that link in the video description. And just a couple final little nitpicks to end on, which are as minor as they get. But hey, this is a modern take from a person with game design skills on a modern remake still having bugs and kinks worked out. So naturally, I'm going to cover every little detail I can find. For instance, turrets, or rather anything which can shoot, are no longer limited to having just one shot in the air at a time. Instead, they now work on a timer, whereby once they fire a shot, a timer ticks down before they can fire another. And this has some interesting implications, but really, it's very minor when it comes down to it. The other thing I wanted to mention is that every episode has its own unique design to the crystals. Except the new fourth episode doesn't. And I kind of expected a fourth episode to have a new crystal design to show off, but whatever. Again, this is just super minor. So yeah, that's my assessment and bug report of Crystal Caves HD. Overall, it's a huge improvement over the original game, with some of its own issues to iron out, but nothing which dramatically affects the gameplay. If you only bought one, either the original or the remake, I would say go for the remake, because it's better in every way that matters and gives you more features on top of everything the original game provided. Except for documentation, which it's lacking entirely, but maybe they'll add some in the future just as a final touch to cap off the experience. 
Anywho, that's all for today's ADG filler video, meaning I'm going back on break from the show and I'll be resuming ADG as scheduled on Saturday, January 2nd, 2021. So, see you all then. Thanks for watching, everyone, and extra special thanks to everyone supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small selection of you guys.